thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be back talking to the KDE folks again. Like it's 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 pretty amazing. It was fun coming and talking to the uh, academy, you know, group. That was super fun talk, and yeah, you know, I hear that it was you know super well received. Even though, you know, I, I like to use one of my um, friends' um, terms that he uses for ham radio. He calls calls himself a appliance operator, and I, I kind of feel like I'm an appliance operator when it comes to. Linux systems, you know, I use them quite a bit throughout my daily life, but, you know, I'm not the uh, uber, you know, Linux nerd that can, uh, you know, get really down in there and configure things, but I'm glad you guys like the story, stories. Um, Before you really get going here, should we um, open up the shared notes to questions? So maybe before we all log off today, if anyone has some burning questions for you, we can maybe get some of those answered. I'm happy to answer uh, questions, that'd be great. Great, so everyone, if as Jerry's going along, you have any questions, please throw those in the shared notes. Um, Jerry, I'll leave you on stage to tell us all your tales of engineering and war <laughs> yeah. stories. War stories, yeah, I had regrets about um, sending that title title over because war sucks. So <laughs> I changed my title, um, you know, for the presentation. And you know, it's kind of fun about this picture that's on the, the slide right now. I was going through my phone looking for pictures for the presentation. And this is literally a picture of me ripping apart a Rubik's Cube not too many weeks or months ago just because I wanted it to, you know, have all the colors on the right side. And I think that's um, maybe a really good illustration for how I approach things differently, like, in, and try to just get things done fast. You know, much of my career, people have criticized me for not doing things the right way, but, you know, sometimes it really works out, like, if you have an end goal to just, just get it done, you know, do it the way that's the quickest. And so that's why I chose this picture. I thought it was great. Um, for some of you that are joining, I was saying earlier, you know, since I spoke at the last, um, at the, the conference, uh, Academy, I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, I told a lot of stories about my childhood and rambled on quite a bit. I think it's important that I share some, some of the similar stories again, but I'm not going to bore you with the same, same stories, I hope. But, you know, some are going to sound familiar, but I'm going to try to double click a little deeper into each of these stories so that it kind of frames, you know, how I think about problems. And, and ultimately, at the end of the presentation, we'll get to my current startup, Tilt 5, where we're making these amazing augmented reality glasses that, you know, this magical world springs out of the table and you can play video games with all your friends. So I was, uh, you know, just to start when I was a kid. I was a very curious kid. I was raised by my father um, by himself. And um, I would take apart all my toys, which was super frustrating for him. And so my father was constantly trying to divert me away from um, dismantling my toys and um, ruining all these things that he spent hard money on. So he would do things like bring me old light bulbs from the gas station that he worked at, he owned, and uh, taught me how to um, hook them up and to batteries and light them up and do things like that. He also, he put a box out in front of the, his gas station with a sign like, bring your junk electronics. And he would bring it to me and just let me rip things apart. It was like heaven. You know, I just had endless supply of little bits and things that I could take apart and explore because I just, I have to know how everything works. It's just for whatever reason, that's how I am. And I lived in this really small town and there wasn't a lot of resources available to me to do electronics. So I spent a lot of time just trying to figure this stuff out on my own. And I started to learn a little bit, things like, you know, components are soldered together and, you know, I didn't have tools to work on, you know, soldering and stuff. And I found like creative ways to, to get around that, doing things like taking resistors and hooking them up to wall transformers so that they glowed cherry red and hot enough that I could solder components. You know, of course, this was very scary for my father, and he um, quickly figured out that I was doing these really sketchy, dangerous things, and um, 
you know, guided me away from that, got me things like soldering irons at a super early age. I, I can't remember how early, young I was when I got a soldering iron, but it was, was you know, stupidly young. I think that uh, maybe it would be child neglect these days to let a kid play with a hot soldering iron like that. Um, but I loved it. Um, I got other like neat gadgets when I was a kid that helped me grow and start to learn on my own. And like this electronics kit that you could get from Radio Shack at the time was really amazing. Taught me a lot about electronics. I spent hours and hours playing with this and started to develop this intuitive feel about how electronics works because you know there was no one there to teach me the, um, the right way to understand electronics. Um, when I got a little bit older, I, um, in my teens and early teens, I ran into some local ham radio operators that um, were very much like me, but, you know, much older. They, uh, you know, were adults and they took me under their wing and they had shops that looked like this, which were amazing. And they uh, taught me more about electronics. But what was really interesting about these ham radio operators that I started hanging out with is you know, ham radio is all about being prepared and working with what you've got. And that was really cool. You know, sometimes I would go to them and say like, well, I don't have this connector to do this certain thing or this certain component. And they're like, well, just go figure out a different way to do it. You know, you know how to cut a piece of wood, make a connector out of wood. You know, it doesn't have to be plastic. Or I wanted to make an antenna. I didn't have like the right wire. They're like, well, you know, go get a clothes hanger and, and, uh, untwist it and use that for your antenna. And so I feel really fortunate that I had mentors like this when I was younger that, you know, taught me that, you know, there isn't necessarily a strict way to do everything. And that's been so beneficial. Um, I also got into early 8-bit computers, which were amazing. Um, my first computer was the Commodore 64. I spent, you know, ungodly amounts of time, you know, plunking away on this and programming it. And, and uh, eventually started interfacing electronics to it, wrote BBSs, you know, did all kinds of really neat things with it. I progressed through a bunch of, of um, other 8-bit computers and 16-bit computers at the time and kind of learned the basics of like working with computers. And this was super early, you know, it was, you know, mid 80s. You know, it was kind of also fun at the time too, because not too many people had computers at the time. And, you know, I show people my computer prowess and they thought that I was a genius and kind of made me feel good even though you know, I don't, don't think I'm a genius at all. I'm just really stubborn and, and like to uh, explore. Um, but I'd be remiss, remiss not to tell the story of when I first got my Commodore 64, I had so little understanding of how electronics and read-only memories and all these things that go into computers was that um, I did some really silly things to these these computers. For instance, my father bought some game cartridges um, for us, and they were really cool. But I wanted more game cartridges, but I didn't understand how they worked. I just thought it was wires connecting inside of them. So I would take forks and knives and plug into the cartridge port and kind of short things out, and beautiful colors would come up on the screen. And um, I ended up burning up with quite a few Commodore 64s doing that, you know, blowing out chips. Um, eventually my father, you know, was, I, I was doing this without telling my father. He, he was convinced that the Commodore 64 was super unreliable and that it actually probably benefited me because I got, you know, newer, better computers. Um, in my teens, I got into doing uh, race cars. Uh, I was a wild child. Uh, um, I was like this picked on kid at school, but I found that, you know, the more wild I was, the more people left me alone. And um, I'd always liked cars, and we had a lot of local tracks around there, and I got obsessed with wanting to build a car. My, I was working with my father at his gas station at this point, and I was begging my father, like, build me a race car. And he's like, there's no way I'm going to do that for you. It's just way too dangerous. And I just pestered him and pestered him, and eventually he said, you know, the only way you're going to get a race car is if you um, build it yourself. And so very driven to, to do this. And so I went out, found some mentors, some people to help me, taught me how to weld. I started working with them on the weekends in their uh, machine shops and uh, built my first race car. Did terrible. Um, I didn't know how to set the car up. You know, I didn't know how to really build them. 
Um, but, you know, I reached out to folks, started learning more, learning how race cars worked. And this was my first um, adventure in engineering, real engineering, because you, know, you could buy blueprints for race cars, but, you know, I was never really wanting to just follow the rules. So I was constantly tinkering with these race cars as I built them and trying different, you know, suspension techniques. I created this really clever suspension that um, brought all the shocks inboard, kind of like a an indie car, you know, how it goes through push rods and things like that. And that has some great benefits. Um, I started taking my skills with electronics and applying it to the race cars. So I built a traction control system that was based off the old 6502 uh, processor. So I would measure the front wheel rotation from a, a magnetic sensor up front, and then I would measure the engine RPM. And I had a simple little program that uh, would trick my rev limiter in the car to um, go into over rev mode and it would cut the engine power so I couldn't spin the tires and it um, gave me this huge advantage. And it was pretty interesting. Um, you know, I was constantly tinkering. It was kind of one of these things, it was it would frustrate my father at this point who had gotten behind me and was really excited that I was racing and starting to do something with my life instead of being a screw up in school. Um, that I would take a perfectly good car that was fast and then I would um, change it and make it worse. But that was the joy of it. I would go out, I would try things. Sometimes it was worse. Sometimes it would be kind of a leap forward. And I did all kinds of things like this, just constantly tinkering with the car. You know, there was a, um, as you go to these different tracks, they have different properties at the tracks, like the dirt that you race on. And um, it changes throughout the night and even throughout the race as it dries out. And, you know, you could set your car up by adjusting these different suspension components. And you were always just trying to guess you know, the perfect setting that would be like the best at the end of the night. And I just thought that was unacceptable. So I started putting motors on different um, suspension components so that I could adjust them when I was racing the car. And so I had all these dip switches in my car going out to these linear actuators and, and lever mechanisms that would change the load uh, on coilovers and move torque arms around and things like that. And uh, you know, a lot of these things I was adding in my car were also getting banned frequently because, you know, as I would start to dominate, the uh, track promoters kind of want equal racing. They don't want some car or some driver running away um, with the race. And ultimately, I was telling Allison, Allison is quite a, a motorhead also. Um, the, the final straw for me on my racing career is um, one night a supercharged Volkswagen car came out that was super lightweight and high horsepower and it just dominated um, the races. And up to that point, I hadn't really considered even a, a four cylinder Volkswagen motor as like even a, a thing that you would put into a race car. So my final year, I started building a dual Volkswagen motor car, one in the front, one in the back with a synchronizer shaft between it, synchronizing the carburetors. And unfortunately, um, just before the race season started, they announced that there was going to be a minimum weight limit, which kind of um, nullified all of this work that I put in this car. And I just threw my hands up I'm like, okay, I'm just tired of racing at this point. There's not enough innovation for me. I don't know if those were the exact words, but that was basically what it was. So um, a, f a friend of mine, we opened a computer store. You know, this is a big, long story. You could go back to the academy talk and hear about it. But, you know, there's lots of ups and downs when I was doing this computer store. Um, I learned a lot, uh, gained a lot of scar tissue, learned how to, like, work really hard because, you know, I didn't know how to run a business. It was really rough. Um, but eventually it took off. And the, the, the actual business side of it was really amazing. It was um, a fun experience. But during this time, I really dove into electronics as a, a side project and put a lot of work into this. All my spare time went into building various electronic things. And there were these new chips that came out at the time called FPGAs that allow you to write some Verilog code or VHDL code and it gets compiled into a simulation of what a real chip is. And that's super powerful. So instead of having to have like a chip that only does one thing, 
you could have a chip that's reconfigurable and you could make it do all kinds of things. And so I was doing tons of experimenting. I would make video cards that plugged into a Commodore 64 and give it like 24 bit color or I'd make a synthesizer and I was just making all kinds of projects with these chips, learning a lot about how to make circuit boards. Even at one point I made a little um, kind of limited run ATX motherboard that had a bunch of FPGAs on it, which was the C1 reconfigurable computer. I had like big ambitions back then. Um, it never really took off. Um, people had fun with it that got them, but it, it was probably one of the points in my career engineering wise where I was growing extremely fast. And during this time I had mentors, but a, a lot of this time I was just exploring and not really um, stuck on following the rules. Like inside these chips, there's like just the right way to program them. But these early chips, you could do some other interesting things with them that are not quite the right way. And you could take a small chip that can't do much and you could kind of hack it to do more by, you know, using internal tri-state buses to hook things together, which is usually a no-no to do. And so that was super fun. The computer stores were going good around 2000. Um, the retail computer store market imploded and I found myself, uh, you know, without a revenue stream and quickly running out of money. So I, I made the bold move to um, go to Silicon Valley and brute force my way into um, startups. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, I dropped out of high school when I was racing cars. I never went to college um, up to this point and, you know, <laughs> it was funny. Every time, like, there was kind of an up and down in my, you know, the computer stores or the race cars and stuff like this, people would be giving me friendly advice, like, you know, you had a good run with this, that race car thing, you should go back to school. Or you had a good run with that computer store thing, you should go back to school, get your diploma, and then go to college. But I've always been too stubborn for that. And so I went to Silicon Valley with no formal education and brute forced my way into a bunch of startups. And that was really difficult. Um, not very many startup founders or teams would take a, a chance on a high school dropout. But I got some breaks. Um, you know, one company uh, took a chance on me. It's not this company, but you know, it kind of got my foot in the door. I did a really good job for them. They were happy and that was a springboard. But this is the part of the presentation where I want to kind of double click a little bit deeper into various projects I worked on and kind of just discuss like unconventional thinking and how it can really benefit you know, projects. So this company still clean hired me, uh, the founder of the company, a really amazing guy, Bob. He was um, very much like me. He kind of bootstrapped himself. He created this business that distributed cleaning solvent to local airports and gas stations to clean parts. And he had this dream of making this machine that could take dirty solvent after you've cleaned a bunch of parts, distill it and put it right back into your parts cleaner. And so he had a small team that he had put together to make this little still. His first prototype of this still was this giant machine that had this big column in it to boil the the solvent and then condense it out and then you get clean solvent that would dump out the other side and um, at the when he asked me to join and help out he had these industrial controllers that were really expensive like hundreds of dollars to control this thing so it wasn't something that he could sell profitably and it was too big and so i walked in the door and he's like well can you make a controller that can just do this simple thing like you know as cheaply as you can like run a heater for a few minutes, turn it off, let the solvent drain out, and then just cycle through until the this, this cycle is done. And so I did that. It was a really short project. I think I did the whole project for some crazy, had like one chip, it wasn't even a processor. And it was like a couple dollars worth of electronics. So he was super pleased. And, but they were having trouble actually getting the product out the door because this, short column that they put inside of it was it was actually based off of a deep fryer for their first prototypes called a fry daddy and it um, would boil the solvent and the oil and gunk would collect in the bottom and the solvent would get 
thicker and thicker and then eventually it'd become very frothy and then it would boil over the top and it would contaminate your clean solvents. So, you know, it was looking like they wouldn't be able to ship a product. And so I went to the, the founder of the company. I'm like, you know, I have a bit of a mechanical background and, you know, I just, I have some ideas. I have these hunches, you know, can I like spend a couple weeks and just kind of play around with the distillation column? You know, this was also beneficial for me because, you know, work was kind of far and few, you know, in between. So a little extra money was going to put food on the table too. And so I went and started working with the other engineers. And this was a very interesting situation where there was a lot of angst that I was there, this, you know, uneducated person playing around in their space. And it was, I got a lot of grief for this, but... You know, I worked um, after hours when a lot of people weren't there and just put a lot of work into this. First thing is like, well, you know, everyone is just guessing at what's going on inside this thing. You know, I want to actually see it. And I just remember like our old oil tank on our um, gas or oil um, furnace at home had like the sight glass that you could look and see where the oil level was. And it's like, well, maybe I could put one of those into this like vacuum system so I could just see what's going on. So I did that. I just bored a big hole in the top of this thing, put it in. And then um, like it takes like hours for this like solvent still to get to this point where it has this boil over a moment. I'm like, I got to figure out how to um, make this happen faster. And so I went to the founder of the company. I'm like, you know, I really want to like speed up the cycle of like this boil over situation. It's like what you do is you just put a little bit of water into the oil and uh, it'll boil over instantly. I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, but I want to like change out oil and stuff and open this column up and stuff. So I made a, a water injector into it and I could just iterate super fast, faster than anybody else. And it was amazing. I'd inject water in this whole like column and be bouncing around and boiling over and stuff. And um, I just thought back to the days when my um, father took me out camping and he had this percolator coffee pot one time he forgot to put the uh, kind of mechanism in there that takes the liquid to the top and showers it down through the coffee grounds and when he did that it just boiled over like out of control I'm like maybe the solution to solving this problem isn't like doing what everybody else is doing with like trying to put hot wires in there or, or little flapper things to uh, smash up the foam maybe I should just make a percolator in there. And so I did that. I made a couple like percolator things, welded them together and put them in there. And it was kind of working, but it wasn't to the kind of um, volume of um, solvent that they uh, they wanted to go through this thing. And, and so one day I was kind of frustrated, like maybe I'm not going to solve this problem. And uh, I injected water into this thing and the column bounced and this percolator thing like tipped over kind of sideways and it was sitting in there at an angle. I'm like, ah, F it, you know, Ugh, mad. I just let it run. And I came back and it's, this thing's just producing solvent like crazy. And I'm like, wow. And it's not boiling over. And I look in there and I find out that it's just this, because the base of this thing's like a solid plate. It's just kind of tipped to the side and the solvent's just kind of circulating on the bottom plate. Boom. Solved the problem. I just put a, a, a solid plate in there and they were able to ship the product and uh, that was really uh, that was really cool um, it it also started to wake me up to you know I'm gonna face a lot of resistance in the future you know there were other situations around the same time that I started to learn that um, there's certain language you can't use around um, some people in engineering, you know, I'd worked with these ham operators and I had learned this intuitive feel. So I'd often say things like, I feel like the solution should be this. I have an intuition that the solution should be that. And that is for some people, like the worst thing that you could say, you know, I remember instances I was in meetings where people were almost screaming at me because I said, like, I have an intuition or I have a feeling. And so, it was super valuable having that kind of rough experience kind of early on in my engineering career. Sorry, that was a little long-winded, but um, I think it's important that also that kind of growth as a 
person. I had to go through that in that particular instance. So another exciting project I got to work on, I done a, worked at quite a few startups at this point, but um, out of the blue, a toy company contacted me and they wanted me to, um, they'd heard that I've done a bunch of things with Commodore 64 as a hobby and put them into these FPGA programmable chips. And they, they said, you know, we've been trying to make a Commodore joystick that has all of your favorite 1980s video games in it and that's nostalgic, but we've been trying to emulate it with a processor and we've been failing. Maybe you can make a chip. And at this point, I'd never designed a chip. I've only played around with these FPGA chips. And they're, they're like, well, can you make a custom ASIC for us that does this it's super cheap that we can make a $19 toy? And I had no clue how to do it. I just took a big gulp and said like, yep, I can do that. And so I got hooked up with a couple um, folks, you know, Robin, who was heading up the software team. And uh, we, uh, we started working on this thing. It was a crazy project. I just didn't know how I was going to pull it off. We'd promised that we'd do it in like less than a year. So I immediately start, ripped apart a Commodore 64, started hooking these FPGAs up to the chips, started trying to emulate these chips and make them as accurate as possible. Uh, meanwhile, I made like a board for the programmers to get started on the software because it had to not only be a Commodore 64, it had to load all these games and it had to do it fast and be snappy and, and uh, all self-contained. So I quickly built this board, sent it to them. It didn't do anything when I sent it to them. I'm like, trust me, in a couple months, this board will do something. And so the very first things that I got running on the board were these kind of unconventional like test um, builds of the FPGA. To the right, I just remember doing this. We were just trying to get the processor running. But, you know, this is back in the early days, early 2000s. You didn't have like really high speed JTAG uh, interfaces that you could, you know, look at things in real time. So I would do dirty little hacks, like I would take all the opcodes and the bits in the processor and I'd just map them to the screen so you could see it in real time. And we would do things where we'd I would make special builds at FPGA that would just, you know, map different memory locations to pixels, and we could just sit there and look at the uh, the uh, pixels flitting around on the screen. Completely insane. I don't know what we were thinking. We there, this was an impossible task, but we eventually got the thing limping along. We were like two weeks before the chip had to be taped out, and I still didn't have composite color output. So the, the team was still working with black and white composite um, output and everyone's getting su super nervous. Like you gotta get us like color soon. And I'm like, don't worry, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And you know, the, the chips that we were using were so small that I had to, the custom chip I had to map it to that I just didn't have much logic in there to, to do proper, um, composite video generation. So I had to do a bunch of um, things that uh, a normal chip designer wouldn't normally do, do asynchronous logic. And thankfully, you know, four or five years earlier when I was dinking around at my computer store, figuring out how to like manipulate, you know, tri-state buffers inside of a chip or, or do latch-based logic, you know, with, you know, FPGAs and things like that. I had that skill under my belt and I was able to get co color composite output without having to add a bunch of, you know, um, external or blower budget on the actual um, chip itself. What was amazing also about this project is it was a really fun crew. We were having a lot of fun and we were distributed. This is, you know, you know, a prototype of what the world with COVID is today. Like uh, one guy was in Canada, one was in Europe, one was in Mexico, one was in, you know, somewhere in, um, Midwest United States. And we just did the whole project um, virtually and uh, got it done somehow. Lots of late nights um, on IRC, you know, uh, trying to debug things remotely. So anyway, we're like a couple weeks away from production. 
we didn't have enough time to do any sample chips, which was really unfortunate. So we had to do this thing called a super hot lot, which you'd push all the chips through without even testing them. And so they pushed hundreds of thousands of these chips through this foundry and they sent them straight to China and they mounted them on the board. You know, we're already late at this point. You know, we had to get it out for the Christmas holiday. And um, I get this angry phone call from the president of this, this toy company yelling at the top of his voice at like how I effed him over that this doesn't work and they spent millions of dollars on this and that I'm going to get on a plane the next day and go to China and fix this problem. Probably one of the scariest moments in my entire career having to be on the other end of that phone line hearing that. You know, I, I joke, but it was almost going through my mind that maybe I should run to Mexico and hide, right? I'd never screwed anything up that big before. So I get to China, I go there. First time to China, it was a really interesting experience. Get to the factory, they open up the, the first prototype and they show me and the circuit board looked nothing like the circuit board that I had sent them as a reference. And thankfully they had taken it on themselves to uh, cost reduce it for me. And they'd taken decoupling capacitors off and ruined the electrical characteristics of the, the device. And this goes back to this next part of the story goes back to unconventional like debugging. These are things that I learned, you know, working with really creative engineers and ham radio operators and people that have this intuitive sense to do things. The first thing I did is I put my finger right on the circuit board and started pushing on things. That's something I learned from the ham radio guys. Like your finger is a great way to inject noise, change capacitance, change the circuit. And sometimes, you can intuitively infer what's going on. Put my finger on it, boom, the thing uh, springs to life. And um, it's like we were able to fix it and get the, the product out. Um, other interesting things kind of along those lines, this is not related to this particular story, but um, a, a thing that I've used quite a bit to kind of do intuitive um, debugging and understanding what's going on in a system is I've used things like AM radios to listen to a circuit. So all these circuits generate interference. So if you put an AM radio next to a circuit that's misbehaving or crashing or locking up, you can hear like these beautiful little, you know, it almost sounds like 8-bit music twer uh, tweets and, and noises. And when things change, you hear different tones that come out of it and you can use that to debug. Uh, you know, there's been many a time I've been debugging a complicated project with a client and they just think I'm insane and think I'm wasting time because I'm using things like an AM radio. Um, but it's, it's super valuable stuff and, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't lose that intuitive side or, or reject it. Yeah, I guess I should tell another funny part of this, this project. I think I talked about the Civic Academy, but um, I saved the day, kind of, right? But then at, when I was at the factory, I dropped into the secret menu that we'd put into the joystick. So the programmers had added a bunch of games. They added pictures of them drinking beer with a famous programmer and, and stuff like that. And one of the toy guys was there and spotted this, and they were mad, really mad. So when I got back to the United States, I had another phone call from the president of this company screaming that, you know, how dare I add anything extra to this? Well, for us, we were kind of all young and we were like, we love the Commodore. We love like the notion of this. Let's make it really special. Let's add things for um, the people that buy this and the Uber nerds out there. And um, we didn't think that people would get mad at us for doing that. And so I was told, like, you're never going to work with us again. Don't tell anyone about this. You're, brah, they're just so mad at me. And so I was like, hmm, that's a bummer, right? But I was talking, I was dating a guy at the time who was really good at um, manipulating things on the web and creating kind of spoof sites and things like that. And so I was telling him about this and like, well, I guess my career in toys is over, at least with this company. And he's like, well, why don't you just tell the world about this stuff anyway, right? If, if it's over. So he made this really cool um, blog site that was supposedly a worker at this factory who liked to hack on 
toys and things like that. And then he had this whole backdated um, blog of hacks and things that this supposed person had done. And the last entry was, oh, by the way, I'm working at the factory on this really cool toy that's super hackable. You can hook a disk drive to it. You can hook a keyboard to it. And you can load your own games into it. And you can do all these other fun things with it. And so he got it on the front page of Slashdot, which was super popular at the time. And I didn't know anything about viral marketing at the time. This was not necessarily meant to be viral marketing, but um, it just blew up. And so this product was actually sold. It was in intentionally made for grandma and grandpa, and it was going to be sold through QVC. And they had this whole marketing campaign on this home shopping network that like, was all around like, you know, your grandkids will be happy if they come over and they have these great colorful games that they can play on the TV and they'll love you, right? Kind of one of those types of advertising campaigns. So they kick this, this off on QVC, it goes live and they just sell out immediately. And uh, I get this call from the, <laughs> the president of the toy company. He's like, that was pretty amazing. That's awesome. Like sorry, I was so mean to you. Like, you know, let's really embrace this. And they produced this thing over and over again. They sold like close to a million units. Um, but what's so funny is they, they lost the, um, the concept of hidden Easter eggs. Like they wanted to document every Easter egg and put it in the manual. And we had to like inform them like that is not an Easter egg. Don't put it in the manual. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Um, so I went on and did like dozens of toys and stuff like that. And uh, toys are one of the hardest um, industries to be in because the design cycle is so short, you usually have a year to get the, the toy done. And so you don't have time for any kind of mistakes. And when you do, you just have to solve it. You know, this is a, a toy I worked on. It was a home arcade machine. Ultimately, it didn't sell very well. The timing wasn't right. The price wasn't right or whatever. But um, we were trying to get this thing built in time. Again, a very similar story. We're working really hard to get this thing done. And the person that did the circuit board layout um, had wired these chips wrong. And so, you know, it would take like a week to get another circuit board and everyone had kind of decided, well, we'll just, we'll just wait a week and this is horrible. We're not going to ship on time. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, it may take hundreds of wires, but I'm going to get this prototype working. And so these are the kinds of things that, you know, sometimes, you know, if you haven't had a background or you have, have been too scared to like experiment and, and work with doing crazy things like this, you wouldn't think about doing. So, you know, I wired up hundreds of wires to these sockets so we could arrange the pinouts so they matched and we got back on track. On um, the same project, there was, you know, a delay on like this whole module and this big arcade machine is heavy to ship. And they're like, oh no, we're gonna like, there's different grades of like shipping boats that you can get on. There's fast ships and slow ships. And they were very concerned that they were gonna lose millions of dollars because they're gonna have to go on fast boats to get these things distributed around the world. Um, and I just out of the blue, I'm like, why don't we just take the electronics and make it a cartridge and for the first, you know, a couple of shipments of these things, you know, at the uh, 3PL Logistics Center, we can just open the boxes and just drop this game cartridge looking thing in there. And so we quickly turned it into a game cartridge and we were able to save the day. Um, this is kind of an interesting and fun toy that I worked on. Uh, ultimately, the toy, the concept of it was these um, little cute um, pets were going to be um, connected by radios and they would sing various songs like who let the dogs out and they'd all have their own personality. You could tap them on the head and they would um, switch to um, doing little riffs within these songs and they contained their own songs, but they could sing along with each other. I love the concept. It was great. We got it prototyped and working. And this is kind of one of those things that, you know, sometimes you work on projects that break your heart. So, it became too expensive to have radios and all this communication in it. And so the scope of the project changed from this really cool thing to less and less. And ultimately it became a, a toy where it just kind of whimpered and cried all the time and it would kind of bob its head around. I always loved the um, inside of it, these um, various 
dogs had different like emotions. Some of them could bob their heads, some could wiggle their ears and stuff like that. But the insides looked atrocious and scary. Um, but I, I love the reviews when this thing came out. Um, the reviews were things like, I got this for my kid. All it does is whimper and cry, it makes my kids cry. I hate it. <laughs> so, you know, not everything is a huge success, um, but it's a fun journey to get there. Um, another like fun, interesting project I worked on in the toy space was this Bratz laptop um, and some variants of this thing. But kind of a funny story around this. And this is, I just, I want to emphasize like engineers like to have fun too. And like if you're management, you need to remember that. And so this was a great group that I was working with. We built it, it was really tough, it was a tight timeline got the prototypes built. Um, the software folks made the mistake of sending me all their source code. So of course I decided like I would do a little trick and I said, all right, I recompiled the code with new audio in it instead of the Bratz audio. I put, you know, filching and passing gas and all kinds of rude stuff in it. And I contacted the software team that was remote and said like, I mean, the prototype is like 99% there, but there's some audio artifacts you're going to have to work on. And they're like, oh my goodness, so scary. Send us the prototype loaded up with software right away. I'm like, okay, it's, it's headed towards you. Um, it was great. You know, they uh, thought it was super hilarious and fun, and we all laughed about it and had a great time. Um, not every place I've worked has been like that, though, which is really unfortunate. Um, so this is a particular project I worked on. It was a reconfigurable processor. Like these days, this kind of thing, you know, neural networks, you know, very common to have a, an architecture like this. But this is early 2000s. We worked on this chip. Um, didn't get much traction in the marketplace. But what was really special about this project, and this is kind of a Linux story, is we had the chip coming back from the foundry. And then we had this FPGA board that was going to talk to it. And we had an ARM processor. We were going to bring embedded Linux up on it. And uh, the embedded Linux was going to exercise the chip and then show off all these features like doing telephony and radar and all this stuff that you could do with this kind of neural network processor. And um, the, the software team had been perpetually behind. And I just sensed that they weren't going to be ready on time. So before the chip came back, and I had worked on this Commodore project before, I took a stripped down version of the Commodore 64 joystick, took everything unnecessary out of it, downloaded it to the FPGA, hooked up a couple wires so I could hook a keyboard up to it and a disk drive to it, and started writing basic code to exercise all the registers and get this thing going. And my managers were so mad at me. They are, you're like wasting time, we're not paying you for this. Like, I'm like, trust me, software team, I just don't think they're going to be ready on time. Like, I would just want to have a head start on this thing. And sure enough, you know, I can't remember what it was called. It was the Lilo or something. They couldn't get it going. It was like a month late. And, you know, by the time they got the embedded Linux going, I had the complete chip up and going and tested. So, you know, I know it's hard for management sometimes to know what's a waste of time and what's not. But, you know, at this point in my career, I started feeling confident and started pushing back really hard when um, folks would give me a hard time about um, doing some of these things. This is another interesting project that I worked on. So this was a very high-end video compression chip back in the um, early 2000s. Um, it was a two-year project. We were a team of five or six people working on this chip, and this is back when H.264 was like brand new and really hard to do and processors couldn't pull it off. And we are working day and night. One of my colleagues snapped this picture. I'd been up all night for some big demo or something we had to do for an investor and I would fallen asleep at my desk. And so we're killing ourselves. We're putting our blood, sweat and tears into this. This is a huge part of our life. And, you know, we're about ready to tape the chip out and send it off to the foundry and so the team we're having a little bit of fun in the last days of this and we found kind of an empty space in the register set and we started putting little easter eggs little like ascii text messages kind of hidden inside of the uh the registers and management found out about this and brought the hammer down on us and just completely 
demotivated us and demoralized us at the last hours. It was really sad. You know, I hate when this kind of thing happens. Like we were working on this ship that it ultimately went into the TiVo and, you know, had quite a good uh, run. But we're working on this thankless job, you know, where no one's going to see this thing that we're working on because it's buried inside of it, um, a TiVo or something. You know, you should, I, I, I am a believer we should always let people, have, engineers in particular, have fun with what they're doing. And so it got all stripped out. And uh, if someone ever reverse engineers the TiVo, they're not going to have any um, little Easter eggs in there, which is really sad. Um, so there's been some interesting um, evolutions in kind of my personal hacking um, that I never expected. So I went to work for this company called New Tech. They're famous for the video toaster back in the day. It was a great honor to go work with this team. This team was amazing. They're out of San Antonio, Texas. I was working on this product. Can't say that I um, contributed a ton to it, but we got stuff done on it. and. Just had a fantastic time uh, with the team. Their office was fun, had scooters, had pinball machines. It was just like, this is like the perfect way to motivate employees. But out of working on this video streaming box, I started doing something in like, I don't know, it was maybe 2008 or so, where video streaming and YouTube was like super early and no one knew anything about it. So I decided to take one of their streaming boxes and just put it in my home lab and just start streaming to the world. You know, nowadays, like live streamers, everyone's doing it. Back then, I was just like, I just kind of need to learn about this industry that I'm working in. And I'm going to do this weird thing. And I felt really awkward about it because my colleagues were giving me a hard time, but it was kind of fun and I wanted to do it. And kind of opened up this whole like side thing that I still do today where I take on um, very difficult um, science challenges and I do them in my garage and I record them. Maybe sometimes I'll even live stream them and I just share it with the world. It's kind of like, I feel like it's my way that I give back and I do um, pretty fun things. Like I have an electron microscope in the garage. I have a full chip foundry in there where I can make little very simple microchips and things like that. Sometimes I'll do an art project like a, a guitar that's built out of the sound chip on the Commodore 64. And uh, it's really satisfying to do that. It allows me to um, be super playful and, and fun with what I, what I do. So this was a super fun project. I know I'm rambling on. I might go over. I don't know if that's OK. Um, Allison, I'll check at the top of the hour. But um, uh, totally, OK. totally OK. All right, I, would try, I won't keep you guys too long. But I've, at this rate, I think I'm going to be a little over. Um, so I'm a little out of order in kind of the chronology of how all of this went together, like these projects, but I just, I wanted to share this one kind of at this point. Um, I had an opportunity a few years ago to build, you know, to work on um, rockets. Kind of, it's been a dream of mine forever. But at the time I had another project, I was trying to bootstrap a startup and I really didn't have time to do this project. And a friend of mine was the CEO of the company. He's like, we are in deep trouble. The folks that were doing the flight computer and the telemetry for um, our rocket rage quit or something. I don't know the full details, but they're not here anymore. We're screwed. You're the only person I can think of that can just come in and get this done. I'm like, no, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he's like, please, please. You know, we're up in Alameda. It's right around, you know, where you're at. Just come up to our facility on Thursday, but it's got to be Thursday. I'm like, okay, I'll come visit. I just want to get to, you know, see what you're up to. So I walk in, there's this giant rocket in the high bay. I'm like, ooh, this is cool. And it's like totally legit looking. And he's like taking me on a tour and there's like this awesome machine shop and people are really cool. And he takes me down this uh, corridor and there's like this test cell where they can test the rocket motors. And he's like, we're about ready to do a static fire of one of these motors. You know, do you want to participate? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, come on in and like sit down and, you know, we'll let you push buttons and stuff. So this rocket motor fires off, the ground shakes, it's loud, there's fire. We're watching this all on these video monitors. I'm like, oh, gosh, no, I don't, I can't do this now. 
He's like, please, I'm like I could probably do four months. I don't know if that's enough to get it done for you, but that's all I can give you. He's like, I'll take it. And so I came in, we started working on this flight computer and I found out, you know, day one after coming in that in two weeks, the um, FAA and someone from the launch facility was going to come in with this telemetry receiver emulator and they needed to see that we could get telemetry coming off of the rocket. And so that's not much time. <laughs> Definitely no time to make a circuit board. So I get the hot glue gun out, I get some dev boards, I start learning about this crazy protocol they use on rockets called iRig, and I just work day and night, put this hot glued together emulation of what the flight computer is going to be. And uh, <laughs> these like three kind of old guys come in from these facilities and the agencies, and I come traipsing out with this piece of plastic with a bunch of hot glued parts on, and they're their eyes roll back in their head. They're like, what the heck is this? And I'm like, trust me, it's it's gonna be fine. The flight computer is gonna be perfect. Don't worry, I got this. I turned on the charm. I let them, or I convinced them to let me hook this up to their hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of test equipment, fired it up. I got enough of the protocol working. They gave us approval. Whew. Like, oh my God. You know, um, lots of interesting stories around this rocket company because they used embedded Linux on it to control the, the rocket. And there was such urgency to get things done. And, and this is something that I've learned over the years is who is the stakeholders in your organization and what can you do to make their life easier? And so there was a software team working on the navigation and the control of the rocket, doing everything right. And then there's other stakeholders in the company. There's like operations folks and folks working on the communication of the rocket on the launch stand and they're completely blocked and they're not going to get their job done in time. So I, you know, I'm not, I can't program worth the dam. So I, my code's super hacky, but I'm like, there is an urgent need. Like if they're going to launch this rocket in a few months for some test software. So I write the jankiest, Linux applications that are just streaming out to the terminal, doing horrific things like printing the screen with all this data and then just sending, you know, the clear screen character and then just doing it again and again and again, flickering and looking horrible. And folks doing the software and the company doing it right are just like snapping at me like, like you, I can't believe you're running such crappy software on the rocket. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm sorry, this is unblocking these folks. Well, you know, it's it was kind of amazing. We got it done. Um, I actually had to work on this during vacation. So I carried like all these emulators and stuff onto a cruise in the middle of the, um, the ocean and finished up, you know, the GPS navigation pieces of it and stuff, but we got it done. They uh, uh, launched the rocket, it took off the pad, like that was amazing. And then promptly did this. Um, came back down, blew a big hole in the ground. But, you know, rockets are hard and um, they did this multiple times. I'm proud to say it wasn't anything that the software team or the, the hardware did um, to cause this, or computers did, I should say, it was all hardware problems. Um, as a, a keepsake, they sent me one of the flight computers that was blown out of the rocket, blown, I don't know, probably a mile away. It was actually sticking out of the side of a building on a piece of like, you know, aluminum that it was mounted to, which was really cool. Um, and they've been able to uh, make it to space uh, with it, which is really cool. And, uh, you know, if you guys are interested, if you look up Astro Rockets, they just had another um, kind of semi failure where the rocket took off and flew laterally because an engine failed. But what was amazing about it is the rocket didn't tip over and explode, which is a testament to the software team for doing it right. Um, so this brings me to um, a point in the story where I started at, working at Valve Software. And so this is where I got the bug for augmented reality and it's what I've been working on for almost 12 years now. So um, <laughs> I started getting these text messages on social media from just random people from this company called Valve. And 
you know, I'm, I'm a gamer. I like to game, but I wasn't really putting like two and two together because I hadn't been much of a PC gamer in quite a few years. And like, what's this Valve company contacting me all the time, you know, wanting to talk to me. And so finally they get a hold of me. And the way they get a hold of me is I collect pinball machines. They show up at this pinball conference and they're like, hey, and they're playing a pinball machine right next to me. And they're like, hey, you're Jerry, right? And like, yeah, yeah hey, we're from Valve, you should come talk to us. Like, we think you're amazing. Like, ah, oh, you Valve people again. <laughs> like, no, no, I don't want to work for a software company that wants to get into hardware. Like, it, I just don't know if it's going to work. And so that didn't work at the pinball conference. They show up at Maker Fair and they like corner me at Maker Fair. Like, please come up, talk to us. You're perfect. Like, we love your YouTube channel. You're the perfect kind of creativity for our company. I'm like, no, no. And uh, finally, I got a, a, a text, uh, a message on one of the social media sites from Gabe Newell, the founder of the company. He's like, I really want to talk to you. I'm going to fly down to Portland, where I was living at the time. I want to just take you out to lunch. And so he, he shows up, and I'm giving him the same line of like, you know, I've been here before working with companies that want to do, software companies that want to do hardware. It's like, sure, you have the constitution to do this. Like, it's way different than software. He's like trying to convince me. He's like, just please, we'll buy you a ticket in the next week to come up. Just come up for the afternoon. Let just meet the team. It's not an interview, which was a lie. I got up to um, Valve. They take me into a room and it was a panel interview basically because they probably <laughs> were scared that I was going to run out the door or something. I don't know. There was probably, I don't know, 10 people and they just started grilling me. It was actually super fun. They were like, so you're going to build a game controller. How would you do it? And I'd be like, oh, I'd go to this company in China and we'd do this type of plastic and this and that. And it's like, we're going to make a game console. What would you do? And I'd be like, well, this and that. And um, I don't know, Gabe Newell, I think, probably did like a nose signal at some point. And like most of the people got up and left the, the meeting. And then Gabe took me around the building and he took me to the fourth floor. And he's like, the fourth floor is all yours. You know, you have an unlimited budget bring all your best people in, you know, this is what I want you to do. He's like, we are catering to hardcore gamers. We have Microsoft that's encroaching in on our business, trying to push us off the platform and make their own marketplace. And that's what Valve does is they sell other people's games primarily. And he's like, this is an exis existential stress, uh, uh, can't talk today, existential threat for us. And I, what I want you to do is to expand our audience and get us into the living room. I want grandma and grandpa all the way down to the grandkids playing video games. That's your mission. What do you think? And I'm like, gosh, that's, I didn't expect to like be interested in this when I came up here. And he's like, come on, you just stay overnight, spend another day with us. And I'm like, well, I didn't bring any toiletries or anything. He's like, don't worry, we'll buy that stuff for you. And so he, he grabbed, you know, someone and, they're like, hey, let's go to the swag room and we'll get you a shirt and then we can, you know, take you out and, you know, shop for any other pieces of clothing you want. And so anyway, they did that for me, put me up in a, a motel and hotel and um, I came back the next day wearing a valve shirt and it's like, okay, I guess I'm part of the team. And and uh, we, we started it and started doing that. And it was really cool. I hired a lot of really great people. We started doing a lot of experiments. We were hooking electrodes to people's minds and feeding that back into games and like showing how we could have all these feedback loops to make games more fun. We were doing a lot of AR and VR experiments. We were just having fun. It was a great team. And there's something you need to know about Valve. It's a very um, interesting culture where they um, pride themselves in not having a uh, a strict management structure. So it's like they just have these mantras like do the right thing for the company, be be the good guys when it comes to anything for the customer, you know, and, and just do the right thing for the customer um, whenever possible. So that that's uh, gives you a lot of latitude to do things and also um, can get you into a lot of trouble too, which I've, I found out. Uh, one of the more comical things is yeah, I was told the fourth floor was mine. So, you know, I grabbed a rental truck and brought my a bunch of my pinball collection and started setting it up in the, you know, by the kitchen area. And uh, the facilities person was really mad. It's like, it doesn't fit the aesthetic. What are you doing? Get this stuff out of here. I'm like, <laughs> like, 
Gabe, you said I can do anything I want. You know, can I keep the pinball machines? He's like, I love it. They stay. It's like already like, you know, a few weeks into it and I'm rocking the boat big time. So, you know, we, we were working hard. Like we were a crew that there was like the uh, nine to fivers and then there was kind of like the, uh, the crew that was getting things done. And it was like this core team of probably eight people and uh, we would come rolling in around 10 o'clock pretty late and then we would be there until sometimes well into the morning working on on different projects because we were just so si excited about it but we also had a lot of fun along the way which um, as i found out um, down the road like some of the folks that were a little bit more strict in the way that they operated it really rubbed them um, ruffled their feathers and uh, we would do things like we were working on augmented reality and things like this and but we would thumb our nose at it also and just have a little bit of fun like this is just one of the little projects that we put together in like 30 minutes to have fun we were making a little promotional video about augmented reality at valve and um, for internal and we took a voltmeter and hooked it up to some like reflectors and stuff so you could view it when you were you know <laughs> when the hat was on we called it the voltmeter hat and we made an infomercial about like, thank you, voltmeter hat. I, you know, I couldn't do it without you, uh, which upset a bunch of people that we weren't taking, you know, this VR, AR stuff serious. Um, but, you know, it was a great crew. We're having fun. We decorated the space how we liked. And then um, one day uh, I got an email, like come to Gabe's office and got the notification that I was part of like this big group that was getting fired. And I was told that I was hard to work with and abrasive, and so I was out. So that was really uh, unfortunate. Um, I found myself, like I, I had this baby project there that I was pushing really hard for, that you could do augmented reality in this really amazing way that solves all these fundamental problems. And uh, it, it was being killed. So I think the, so I knew I knew I was getting fired. So when I got that email to come up to the uh, Gabe's office, I knew it was to be fired. And uh, so I walked in the door with all intentions to just chew Gabe out. Like you told me I could do whatever I want and yada, yada, yada. And like, you're killing my baby, this amazing AR project. And of course I walked in, I, I said something like, well, this is how it's gonna go. And then immediately broke down into tears. Like, I can't believe you're killing this, this AR project. So good. It's exactly what you told me to do. It's like, oh, it's like brings the whole family together. And, you know, he tells me I'm, everyone says I'm abrasive and I got to go. And, and the best thing that I ever did as I was walking out the door is I just swung around. I'm like, you should just sell me that technology. And he's just like, okay. So $100 and a lot of legal paperwork I now had this um, really clever technology as my own. So um, this is a very long story. I've done a whole like um, probably almost hour and a half talk on like how my first attempt at getting um, this AR project going, how it was just this huge roller coaster. I'm not going to go into that um, right now, but it, it was a big learning experience. Like we left Valve we founded this company. We didn't know how to run a startup at the time. I was scared to run the startup um, as the CEO. So I outsourced that to external CEOs, which can't, <laughs> we had a lot of CEOs cycling through. We raised a bunch of money because AR and VR was really hot at the time, but we blew a big crater in the ground um, by um, not running the, the company correctly. But we learned a lot, you know. And so a group of us after the first company imploded, we got together and like, we've really taken this project far and it's great, people love it. And now we kind of know what went wrong. Why don't we do it again? And this was actually, actually to back up a tiny bit, it was Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, who called me the day after the news broke that the company had to shut down. And he just gave me a pep talk and he said like, coming from a founder that's had a lot of failures, just remember, you know, there's always a way. If you want to make it happen, just go find it. And so a group of us got together and we started talking about it. I went out, reached out to my mentors and we figured out how to do it. And so we went out, raised a little bit of money. We spent a lot of time thinking about like what went wrong and 
one of our problems was we were trying to boil the ocean. We were AR glasses, but we were going to be AR glasses for everyone in the world, and it was going to do everything for everyone, which is understandable considering kind of the marketing that was around a lot of AR companies at the time. We were just following along. But that was one of our biggest mistakes. And so we thought about it, and we're like, we all love games. We're all gamers. This mission that Gabe originally gave me is such a, an amazing mission. And game trends are heading in that direction right now. Like when I was at Valve, like the statistics for people that played games together as a social event was about 50% of the people that played games. About the time that we founded um, Tilt 5, my startup, new startup, it was approaching 70% and it's only grown. People are going into games to socialize with, you, with each other more and more. In fact, kind of a funny side story, uh, one of my investors in Tilt 5, Big Gamer, suggested that we should jump into GTA 5, drive around in cars, and just talk to each other on voice chat uh, for our next meeting, um, which is really cool. And so that's happening more and more. So we were convinced Playing games together, bringing the whole family together was a solid market um, that we could go into. And it's turned out great. We've had a lot of momentum. These glasses, you put them on, this magical world springs out of the table. You can directly interact with all these holograms that just, you know, are just right there in front of you. And it's the things that we've dreamed about since we were kids. And what's also great about this um, system that we put together is that it also connects people over long distances. So you don't have to necessarily be in the same room. You can um, link game boards together and have that same feeling, even if some of your friends are across the world. And it, it solves some of these fundamental problems that we have in video games you know, currently. It's really hard to have a multiplayer game experience. You. Uh, usually have like one television in your living room maybe you can have like a multiplayer game on that but it's only a certain type of game with our system it allows you to play action games board games all kinds of games you can have your own view into the experience and you get your own private view into the experience so you don't have to have three tvs three xboxes three playstations three switches to have a multiplayer game experience in your home so We've been working really hard on bringing content to our system. And this is the breakdown of the content that we're bringing on, onto the system for launch. And launch is just a matter of weeks away. Um, so if, if you've uh, backed our Kickstarter campaign, um, keep an eye out for our next update. Um, it'll be very meaningful. But, you know, sometimes people look at this because it's kind of in a game board form factor that it's only good for um, board games, but actually the, the breakdown of their launch titles look like this. There's a, some sandbox and creativity tools. There's a lot of board games. We have hundreds of um, available board games through some of the platforms that we've uh, um, brought over to the system like Tabletopia. But we also have dozens and dozens of pure video games that range from action and puzzle and party and racing and just almost everything you can imagine, flight simulators and stuff like that. It's super exciting. Around the office right now, we're so close to launching that, um, and all this content's coming in, we're doing these dog fooding sessions where we get to play um, these games. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the product and double click down into that, because that's kind of interesting. And this kind of ties back to the Valve story. Why didn't Valve understand what I was trying to say at the time, and that this is such a good way to go? In the upper left-hand corner, this is what I built at Valve to do it. This god-awful helmet thing that you had put on with like these big projectors. It was super limited, didn't work very well, but I could see you know, the potential in it. And I just couldn't convey like this is really going to be great once we evolve. So after my departure from Valve, you know, a group of us got together and I started working on miniaturizing the projection system so it looked more like glasses and this upper right hand corner this is a purely hand built prototype that i built on my dining room table with hot glue and lenses that i pulled out of point and shoot cameras you know i had 
no reason to believe that I could make projectors so small and, and that it would work, but you know, I just had to figure it out because I really wanted this project to survive. And so we went out and we showed this to a bunch of people. People got excited because it worked really well. And we started talking to manufacturers about various components, like building these projectors. It was hilarious when um, one of these companies that does custom projectors you know, came in and took a look at this prototype. They were just aghast at what I had done to put this together. They couldn't believe it worked. And so they're like, we can do so much better. I'm like, great, let's do that. And so they run off and they're doing simulations and they're starting to build these um, projectors and they're sending the simulations over and how big the projectors would be. Would be. And they were giant. They were like just too big. They were going to be like these big things on your head. You couldn't make a sleek, really nice pair of glasses out of these things. And I'm like, this just isn't going to work if they're not small. And they're like, well, to have performance, it's got to be have all these lenses in it. And like, well, do you mind sharing the prescriptions to all those lenses? And can I play around and see if I can do anything? And they're, they didn't scoff or anything, but they're like, yes. And they sent the, um, the, the prescriptions over. I got some free academic um, optical simulation tool and um, started uh, messing around. And I just made this one observation, probably because I'm not formally trained in optics and I shouldn't know that this is the wrong thing to do. But, you know, the illumination comes in from one side, goes through a little beam splitter, turns a 90 degree and hits like an, an L cost panel. It's like a little LCD screen and then goes back out to the projection lens. But that beam splitter thing is giant because it had to be giant. And so the observation I made is like, what if I just put a lens like on the illumination side and just kind of shrink the light down, run it into a smaller beam splitter and then run it through another lens that bloats it back out and then shrinks it back down, runs it through the beam splitter and then back out the lens. So I was able to like shrink the, the projectors down really small but I didn't know if it would work. So I put this simulation together, sent it over to the optics guys and they're like, oh my goodness, like we had never considered doing that. It's like, again, sometimes it's good to, uh, you know, not be afraid to uh, not do it the right way. So the basics of how our system works and why it's so special optically is there's this real problem if you wanna do augmented reality glasses. You know, if you want to put the light directly into your eyes, that's a horrendously difficult problem. And we've seen there's dozens of companies that have tried to do this. And there's always like these really severe limitations to the experience. It's usually a little tiny image. It's very ghostly. You can't draw blacks. Um, it's fixed focus. So like your images have to be pretty far away or it starts giving you headaches and things like that. The observation that I made at Valve Software on this technology originally was one day I was working in the lab and I had a projector and I was trying to put light directly into my eyes and just struggling like everybody else in the industry. But I accidentally put a beam splitter in the wrong direction, and projected out into the room. And one of my colleagues had a piece of this material called retro reflector hung up on the wall doing some kind of other experiment. And I saw this beautiful image clear across the room. I'm like, wow, that's weird. Didn't think much of it. Weeks went by, you know, I was probably in the shower. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, if we turn the optics inside out, so instead of just trying to put the light directly into your eye and having these limitations, what if we just project it out to a game board? Because you're gonna be playing on a table or in your living in your, anyway. And that way I can generate an entire light field. So the light rays are going the correct path as if your virtual object was a real object. The light is actually coming from that location. So. I put that really giant prototype together, tried it out, and like, oh my goodness, it works. You know, of course, the quality was horrible because I didn't, you know, fully understand everything yet. And uh, that that is um, how I discovered to turn the optics inside out to solve this problem. It allows us to make systems that are lower cost, wider field of view. We can draw blacks. We can have a comfortable experience that you can play for hours. And it's all because of this magic material. And this material is, it's amazing. It's like been around for a hundred years and you've probably seen it 10,000 times or a million times even 
it's like on safety vests. It's like the reflective material and safety vests is on road signs. It's like super common, easy to get. It comes in all kinds of different variances that you can tune for whatever properties you want. So and here's some of the features uh, of the product. You know, massive field of view, super lightweight. It's got microphone and speakers built into it. We have this uh, tracking system that's built right into the headset that um, stabilizes the images um, so that they're running at 180 frames per second, no matter how you move your head around. Um, it just plugs in through USB um, connections. So you can hook to phones, tablets, PCs, and another exciting device I'll uh, uh, share in a moment. We have these cameras built in that we can do a bunch of different really cool machine vision things with, like you can do, um, you can track hands and objects through these machine vision cameras. And then we also have our magic wand. It's so funny, people always give us a hard time about the, the look of the wand. It looks like a barbecue lighter. And it's like, that is not a mistake. You know, everyone knows how to poke something with a stick. Everyone knows how to pull a trigger on things like hot glue guns or a, a barbecue lighter. Um, so it works brilliantly um, in this AR experience. So um, for the more geeky folks in the, the crowd, this is kind of conceptually how our, our system works. So at the base, we have plugins for Unity and Unreal, and we also have a native SDK coming out. So this is where your simulations or your games run. So you create a game. And so, and you put our plugin into the game, it's drag and drop. We're super proud of how easy it is to develop for a system to drag this into Unity, and you're almost up instantly. So in the headset, the cameras are figuring out where your head position is, figuring out your, your um, pose is what it's called, and how the images need to be created in the game. It passes those down over USB to the game engine. It receives that. The game engine creates a picture, which is in the position as if it's on the game board or floating the game board, wherever you want to put it in the game, which is um, up to you. And then um, it sends it back up over USB 3 to the headset. It lands in the headset. But here's the, the issue, right? You've moved your head after you've already told it where your head position is, so the image won't line up. So we have a really high-speed processor with a bunch of DSP slices in it that is doing a thing called reprojection, which is um, realigning the image 180 times a second. We have this really tight loop between the cameras and this inertial measurement unit to make sure that no matter how you move your head around, it's predicting and, and moving the image into the um, correct place. And that, that just makes the image just like solidly locked and super buttery smooth. It also um, allows us to do something that's interesting. So in virtual reality systems, you're locked to a vertical sync. You know, an image is generated by the game engine, vertical sync comes along, it gets scanned up through a video connection like HDMI up to a headset or a monitor. And if you miss that vertical sync, you have to wait an entire frame period. And that really makes a lot of um, visual artifacts. So we've made that asynchronous. So however um, long it takes for the image to be created by the game engine, we just accept it. And then we just reproject it into the, cre um, the correct location and, uh, oh, I just noticed our slide says 240. It's actually 180. Sorry about that, folks. Um, the, uh, um, if there's an opportunity to slip it into one of these like micro frames, we just slip it in, we reproject it in the correct place. And if there's a frame drop, for instance, like if you wanted to run this thing over a network or something instead of like a USB connection or receive your frame, frames over, say, a 5G connection, we can absorb all that latency and do this reprojection and realign the image and um, upscale any kind of frame drops. Sorry, I'm getting a little geeky there. I'll move on. So we just received the Steam Deck, which is super exciting. And uh, one of our team members in a matter of, I don't know, he probably messed around with it for, I don't know, an hour or two here and there, um, got our glasses working on the, the Steam Deck, which is super exciting. And I think this is pretty interesting to this audience in particular, because it has the plasma desktop um, on it. You know, the first time, you know, uh, our, Justin, our engineer, uh, shelled out to the desktop, he's like, 
oh, this is interesting. And then he tried to open up a console. He's like, console with a K. He hadn't experienced it. I'm like, I know that. I know our glasses already run on that desktop. And sure enough, you know, it worked right out of the gate. So it's pretty awesome. You know, there's some other nuances to it, like, um, you know, native um, Linux Unity projects run on it. Um, there might be a little bit of work we have to do with all of their Windows emulation that they're doing. Um, time will tell, but that's pretty exciting. Still love the folks at Valve. This is a really cool piece of hardware. Kind of a funny note about um, what we were thinking back in the day about 12 years ago. Um, the notion around Valve was that portable gaming was dead. You know, 3DS was out. It looked like it was waning. Um, PSP and some of these other devices weren't um, getting traction. Everyone was like, you know, phones have like killed it all. Tablets have killed it all. It's never going to come back. You know, I'm gone out of Valve and everything. The Switch comes out and just crushes the market. So kind of interesting. I'm, I'm super happy Valve's done this. So with that, I probably should wrap up. I really appreciate, you know, the KDE crew for letting me go way over time. I, I encourage you, take a look at um, our website. Take a look at what we're doing. Um, you can go there, buy a kit if you want to. It's super developer friendly. Every, every pair of glasses you get, you get free access to all these tools. And so anyone can uh, mess around, works on Linux and um, should be pretty fun for a lot of the folks in the audience. Thanks so much, Jerry. I always enjoy listening to you and I'm sure the others have as well. I hope there that was okay. I didn't repeat my uh, too many stories, did I? No, not at all. Not at all indeed. We have a few questions from the audience um, because we are running a little late and just in case some folks are located in Europe, um, I'd love to ask you a few that are in the, the shared notes. First I have all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> First of which so. is, do you still play the bass? Oh, <laughs> I've had, the, you know, okay, the story of the bass. Um, so uh, this might be a little long and rambly. In junior high, I wanted to sing. I was super excited about singing. We had a project where we had to sing in front of our classmates, and they teased me, and then... I never, I was like, I'm never doing that again. And so fast forward probably 30 years, I'm like, screw those people. Like, I want to sing. So I went out and found a vocal coach and started working on learning how to sing. And she was great. She's like, you have terrible timing. Like, you just can't keep a beat for anything. Like, you're probably the worst I've ever seen. No, but she said it nicely. And uh, she's like, what I want you to do is go out and try to learn an instrument so you can kind of get the rhythm of, you know, and it's going to help your singing. And so I didn't know what kind of instrument I wanted to play. So I went out and got a bass, a guitar, I got like one of these electronic drum sets and stuff. And um, yeah, started kind of dinking around with that. And um, what was kind of funny is I've never gotten good at any of those instruments. And I don't know if my rhythm's gotten any better. And unfortunately, when I moved to Valve, I moved away from my vocal coach and I haven't done any um, singing practice since. But now I'm a little less afraid. I won't do it for you guys today because I don't want to hurt your ears. Um, but the Commodore, the, they might be talking about my Commodore bass. That was just a gimmick that I put together. I just like had a free afternoon and I had an old bass that was just junk. And uh, like, you know, I bet I can put a piezo sensor under each one of these strings and measure the frequency when I strum it and then convert it into signals to go in or control into the original sound chip that when it was in the Commodore 64, which, you know, old, uh, old chip tune folks just love the Commodore 64 sound because it's really, I don't know, I love it too. And uh, so I put this thing together pretty quickly. I had a little FPGA that was just frequency counting the notes and I could just drum it and it get converted to SID music. And uh, I took it to Maker Faire. I think it's the first place I showed it off. I uh, was wearing my roller skates with a little amplifier clipped to my belt and, and playing bass, like plunking out, uh, you know, a couple little tunes here and there. And it became like uh, people it went pretty viral on that one. People loved it. Uh, what's really sad about it is um, at my previous startup, we had a, a uh, game jam where we invited a bunch of people into our space to kind of play around with the system and and uh, build games and play with it. 
and I had my, my base there and someone stole it. You know, no good deed goes unpunished, I guess. And so who knows where that base is? And people are, keep asking me like, well, you should just build another one. I'm like, nope, you know, it would never be the same. It wouldn't have the same kind of love associated with it. So it's just a one-time thing. What a bummer. Well, <laughs> let's hope whoever gets what. If you're watching. Karma. Karma. <laughs> Karma. Um, have another question. What kind of desktop application would be best suited to Tilt 5? Oh, that's a great question. You know, although we're focused on games, board games, action games, and stuff like that, I would say, like, I just kind of monitor our inbound on our DevRel. Probably a third of the folks that reach out to us can recognize that this works for uh, non-gaming applications. So we're seeing all kinds of stuff, which government uses and data visualization and oil and mining. There's just tons of people using it for um, different uses. There's a company doing um, virtual cadavers. It's like perfect for that. You can use the wand to like, you know, do um, dissections and things like that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, productivity tools. So things like Maya or Blender. So there's folks that are waiting for our native SDK to like integrate into like in some of these 3D modeling tools. You know, I can say those are gonna be amazing. Um, our system already works real time with Unity. So when you're building your scene, you can drag game objects in and you can be wearing the glasses and you just look over the game board and you can like drag them up and down with your mouse and they move instantly in 3D space. So you can position things and it's, it's far more effective to position things spatially when you're actually looking at them spatially. And so I suspect um, once we have some of these plugins for things like Maya, it's gonna be pretty amazing. It'll probably be kind of a similar thing. You may still work on your PC, but you can look over and immediately see what the end result's gonna look like. Just, just like in Star Wars, just sitting there right next to you. That's incredible. Well, I guess this kind of goes into another question. Are there any Easter eggs in Tilt 5? Tons. Uh, since I'm the boss this time and the CEO, I highly encourage it. Actually, that brings me to a point. Um, you know, I was just trying to express like different work environments I was in. You know, some were really strict and, you know, we just have to do it the right way and some place where it's more playful. Um, I found that more playful environments, you know, really causes a lot of buy-in from your personnel. You just become emotionally attached to what they're working on, even if you're doing fun things that aren't directly associated with the product. And uh, like our office right now, we just moved into a bigger space and I have probably 25 pinball machines set up in there. I'm, I've been setting up almost a museum of old game consoles and computers. I have like the, the first joystick for the Odyssey game console and I have all these joysticks set out and stuff. And it's really a, for a company that's doing a lot of um, gaming focus right now, it's really great to go look at all this hardware and say like, you know, here, Sega had an amazing platform, the Sega Mega Drive or the Sega Genesis, and then they kind of messed it up by like adding all these weird plugins that you could do. And it's like, let's not do that. And so it adds this creativity and like it deepens your thinking of how you're going to, um, you know, approach the problem. But as far as Easter eggs, yes, there's lots of Easter eggs. Um, <laughs> I want to caution people, there's lots of Easter eggs on the circuit boards. But if you uh, happen to open like our glasses, these things get assembled, they get calibrated, they're optical systems. If you open them up, you're likely to throw off that optical calibration um, and not be able to get it back together the same way. So if you do it, you know, just reach out to me, I'll recalibrate your glasses for you the first time. But um, the first time it's free. The first one's free, at least for the Kickstarter backers. <laughs> if it becomes a problem, maybe uh, we'll have to like clamp down and be too corporate. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lovely comment here. It says, I just want to say that I watched Jerry's fantastic interview with Tyler McVicker a while back, and this is a great companion to that interview with non Valve stories, although Valve stories are good too. I think that's lovely. You definitely I think have there's. Quite a few <laughs> 
I, I can ramble like with the best of them. So there's a lot of interviews that are quite long. There's some really good interviews. I encourage you to look up, I think it was EEV blog. If you want to hear about the tragedy of Cast AR, my first startup, I go into great detail. Um, and in fact, I, I believe in being very transparent and just telling it how it is from my perspective. I know everyone else has their own perspective, but I just tell it from my perspective. And uh, I did this, oh, it must have been an hour long or hour and a half long interview just talking about like everything that I did wrong and people, you know, just like how we did things wrong. And people love it. Um, my investors at the time were like, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, this is like, you're, you're talking about the flaws of the investment community and you know how they can run you off the rails in your company. I'm like, I don't care, right? If an investor is upset that I can't talk about the realities of venture capital, then they're the wrong investors for us. No, that absolutely makes sense. Um, well, I guess there aren't many questions left, um, but if we on one, let's let's choose this. Can we see the Tilt 5 console work? Oh, it work? Um, the best place to go take a look at it is on our website, tilt5.com. So we have through the lens footage that you can see there. So a lot of companies that do AR, they like do these like crazy things like whales jumping out of the... Uh, the floor and things that aren't even possible. So we try to be pretty honest about what it looks like. Like this picture on the screen here, you know, that's composited because we we wanted to like show a uh, low angle and get everyone in there. But this is really what it looks like for these three players that are looking down at that game board. And as well, we uh, the lower right um, picture here that was shot straight through the glasses in a Catan-like game. And oh, I should also mention like, we have struck some really exciting deals for content. Um, we can't announce them right now until we're a little further along, but I am so excited the traction that we've got getting content because I, I remind the team almost on a weekly basis, you know, it's so easy to get um, focused on like the plastic and the sensors and stuff that you're, you're working with every day and forget what you're really selling. And I want to give props to a previous CEO, my previous startup. He did one thing really amazing once. <laughs> well, maybe that's a little mean, but he said one thing that was really amazing. He says, I'm selling fucking holograms. And I, we had shirts made up, ready, set, effing holograms on the back. Just remind the team, that's what we're selling. We're selling games and holograms. It's not the plastic. It's not the sensors. So. You know, all your decisions need to be like, you know, focused on like, how can we make that really great and, and stay focused on getting lots of lots of content and, and great games for the system or other applications too. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Well, I guess there's still things coming in. <laughs> I should also mention, this people are asking, where, where can you see... Um, the system. So we've started shipping to our Kickstarter backers. We just finished up what we call our beta backers. These are folks that paid extra money to get like the most prototype hardware. So we did a couple runs in the factory. Things started looking good. We sent them hardware and the feedback has been amazing. Um, you know, a lot of them hang out on our discord and tell us about all the things that they're doing on the system. One gentleman uh, took the glasses and went to a demo coding competition in Europe. So uh, it's, I love these things. It's like where hardcore programmers go and show their prowess off. And he won his um, category with our glasses. He wowed people with it. So these things are out in the wild. You're going to be seeing more of them. And in a matter of weeks, a lot of them are going to be going out. So that's super exciting. Sorry. No, no, that is. Um, speaking of, of seeing them everywhere, it says, can you share any details regarding where the Tilt 5 can be bought? Uh, just our website right now, we're gonna do direct sales. So right now um, we did a Kickstarter campaign, we're fulfilling those, but you can also pre-order. And so after we fulfill our Kickstarters, that's gonna take us um, 
know, into the first part of next year to get Kickstarters fulfilled and get our backlog of pre-sales. We've been pre-selling a lot of units, so we have a little catch up to do. And talking about challenges and having to overcome issues, like the world's really messed up as far as manufacturing. We have not been able to travel to China to solve any problems. So we're having to like, everything is just protracted and drawn out It's so long. Like something that would take 15 minutes at the factory take like two weeks sometimes because we're having to ship stuff international freight. And, um, but we've done some really cool things. This might be interesting for folks. So, you know, as soon as COVID hit and we got restricted from traveling to the factory, we started um, building robotic test equipment so that we could test the the glasses and the wands and stuff remotely. So we could, um, we had to make all kinds of firewalls to get through or VPNs to get through the firewall of China and stuff like that. But um, I'm super proud of what the team did to make these little robotic rigs. You can put the glasses in. We can actually figure out what's going on by wiggling them around and be like, you know, give feedback to the, the factory, like, no, you did this wrong, or you misaligned that, or you put your thumbprint on a lens, you need to go and correct that. But, you know, the, the supply chain is really messy right now. I feel very fortunate. We, uh, we just dodged a big bullet. There's like just recently been a huge semiconductor shortage. But fortunately for us, because we didn't anticipate getting shut down with COVID. We had purchased a lot of our semiconductors in advance and they were just sitting there. So only a few things um, became a shortage. And actually I, at the last minute, like in the last month, I had to do a change to our circuit board design. <laughs> and quickly we spun new circuit boards, put a new chip on because we couldn't get this particular chip that we we're short of. It's crazy. It's really crazy. I mean, sometimes our Kickstarter backers are like grumbly, like you're a year late. And it's like, uh, I know, but it's like really hard what we're trying to do. We probably would have been late with no COVID, but you know, it's really, really hard now to manufacture. I can only imagine. Well, I'm sure I'm sure when you start really heavily manufacturing, you'll find more things to improve and, and oh, yeah. find things that work even better than you expected. No doubt I'm, about it. I'm so excited to get like, you know, we sold thousands and thousands of these. The feedback we're going to get, you know, pushing that many units out onto the market, we're probably going to, I don't know what all the stats are for some of these other bigger companies, Magic Leap and HoloLens, but we're probably, you know, on par with what they've sold of their really expensive systems. You can buy like 10 of our systems for the price of one of their systems. But having that many people out there like using kind of bleeding edge technology like this, we're going to learn a lot. And they're going to, who knows, you know, we have these theories like, oh, our barbecue lighter is perfect. And then, you know, one of our um, backers be like, well, no, it needs to be like this shape. And in fact, we're trying to do, you know, I admire Val for always trying to be the good guys, right? Um, one of our beta backers wrote me the other day and he's like, you know, I only got one wand with my system, but I want to do this experiment and make an, a different shaped wand, you know, and I don't want to ruin my one wand. Like, can I get some circuit boards? I'm like, sure, they'll be in the mail. Boom. Send him a couple circuit boards. Who knows, you know, maybe he's going to invent like an amazing wand with it or or a unique application. And that's that's our core belief, too, is try to be the good guys. You open your glasses, mess the calibration up. You know, if you don't do too much, we'll take care of you. And, you know, we'll try to be the good guys. Not even just being the good guys, but being human. <laughs> and, you know, talking about doing the right thing, I'm kind of scared about what's going on in the AR space right now. We have big companies that are, their whole business model is collecting data on people and then manipulating them to buy things through ads. Um, when we start to do this kind of AR a everywhere type thing where people are wearing glasses as thin as yours that are like projecting images all over the place and can gather so much data that they understand you better than you do, um, the amount of manipulation that's possible is truly frightening. And so we talk about that a lot around the company. We wanna be super ethical about what we do. And we believe that there's like, you don't have to go to those extremes to like do negative things to your users to have a hugely successful business. And that's our goal is to be like huge. We want to be as big as Valve, you know, someday and 
be be the good guys or the good folks or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Okay. Officially, one final question, although there okay. are a few left, <laughs> is Tilt Five open source? Parts of it are. Um, there are some trade secrets, like the firmware that goes up on our heads headset. But we've tried to leave, like if you look at our Unity um, plugin, like everything's in the open as much as we can. And so it's not completely open source. You know, it's um, difficult to do. And, you know, we want to have some control of our trade secrets. Um, all, of our, all of our development first starts on Ubuntu Linux. So we're going through this big... Um, SDK revision 15 is what we call it. And it's super exciting, the, the features that are added to it. So it's kind of agonizing for me because all of our games are on Windows and it's going to be on like Android and things like that. Um, there's not a lot of games on Linux right now. So we don't really, have, we don't have any like game developers putting stuff on Linux. So these the software team gets these new like improvements made. And, you know, the best we can do is like, you know, I. I go into Unity and I like drag some cubes and stuff around. I make a little project and I wiggle my head around or I move the wand. I'm like, oh, it's looking good. I can just like, if I interpolate and just kind of imagine it's going to look so good when we get it moved over to the Windows platform and get all these games. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I guess that gives open source folks a little bit more encouragement to create some new games. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should uh, throw the caveat in there. My co-founder, Jamie, um, he does a lot of like the SDK planning and stuff. And he, he always wants to say like, we unofficially support Linux because there's just so many flavors of it and there's just so many configurations. So, you know, you're kind of on your own if you start messing with our, um, our, uh, our Linux based SDK because we can't guarantee every single flavor, but I, um, the machine that I'm using right now is my home work, sh work machine using Plasma, KDE's um, Ubuntu variant, and the glasses work fine on it. That's amazing. So, as wow. of today, it's amazing. Uh, amazing. So, well, I want to thank you one more time, and it's always so wonderful to hear your stories. There were still questions. Um, I would say, can folks reach out to you to ask their questions that might not have been answered? Uh, yeah, um, my email is really difficult okay. to, to figure out. So it's jerry at tilt5, J-E-R-I. Oh, great. I hope that for the few questions that we didn't answer, if they are still wanting those answered that would be lovely and we have a great we also have a great team on our um, developer side so if you're a developer and want to do something with our glasses there are loaner kits available for certain projects that we get excited about and um, there's support there in particular we're mostly interested in games this year um, so feel free to reach out to on our website there's some developer um, contact information. Those folks are great. They'll they'll lead you through what you need to to do to get a game up and going. Usually, it's just a few minutes to get it basically going. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, even more incentive for folks here to reach out. I'm sure there's at least a few developers in the room. So, as always, again, I can't ever say thank you enough, Terry. It's super fun. I love talking to you guys. It's so. It's so great. You're kind of my kind of people. So keep it fun. Put a lot of Easter eggs in and have a good rest of your weekend. You too. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you Bye. next time.